Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. Thanks for tuning in. Here's part two of our conversation with recording legend Howie Schwartz. There were all these parallel scenes going on. You know, you mentioned London, you mentioned New York, L.A., you know, but Uh at the same time, you know, the world was a lot bigger back then. I mean, it wasn't like you could just get on a a video call with somebody. So you really had these kind of independent scenes going on where it, it wasn't quite competition. But, you know, as you say, you know, you guys were watching George Martin, you know, and... Uh, you know, watching George Martin was listening to the Beatles record. Exactly, exactly. You know, and just sitting figuring there out and they're... getting a little right. What the hell are they okay, doing? Play it yeah. again. Play it again. Play it again. Or the Moody Blues. Oh my God. Oh how, yeah. How about that stuff? You know. Exactly. Or listening, uh, listening to yes, Leon Russell. I mean, but Leon Russell really played. I mean, they, you know, his band was him, Joe Cocker, um, Billy Preston. I mean, it was just. Oh, give me a break, guys. It's just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the talent level was just amazing. Oh, but also, was... I think it was kind of, it was interesting how these individual scenes, they kind of, you know, and they all had their own character, of course, you know. Right. And, you know, how they all kind of informed each other, you know. So, it, 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 I mean, what's interesting to me is how you kind of, you know, you went from L.A. to New York, you know, and you fit into both scenes. But at the same time, there must have been a world of difference. When I came to New York and I was working for a few studios before I opened my own studio in 1975, um, I tried to set up whatever room I was working in, L.A. style, because New York was boxes. It was old radio stations that they made into recording studios. Uh, New York was no studios built from scratch. It was was um, broadcast studios that became... Recording studios. CBS was a ballet school. CBS uh-huh. on Fifty Second Street was a ballet school. CBS on on Thirtieth Street was an Armenian church. Um, there, uh, the, the ballet school was hysterical. That's you know, a bridge over troubled water and all that stuff was was recorded there. Roy Halley was mm-hmm. one of the engineers, and Don Palouse, who's still around. Roy Halley's still around, um, and then. Uh, CBS Records sold Columbia Records. Um, it was um, who was the head of Columbia Records at that time? Mitch Miller. Oh, that's um, right. Sure. Yeah, he was the head of Columbia Records. Sold it to Don Fry, who was working at NBC, and Phil Ramone, and they bought. But actually, it was a trade because CBS still wanted Fifty Second Street. Uh, yeah, they wanted 52nd Street. And so Don, uh, Phil had made a deal for 52nd Street. And um, uh, so they did a trade. Uh-huh. Okay, because uh, it was it was a deal. And it was, it was, that was a crazy time. Anyway, I just did, did it L.A. style. Where, yeah, because, I mean, uh, you know, L.A., you had studios like, you know, you had Conway, you had Cherokee, you had these places that were built – really as studios and not necessarily right. in a in a recording studio environment you know not at all one of the things that was was great is you know uh, at conway it was a house yeah exactly and, you know and they made it into and that's really what everybody was trying to copy was the the human part of it the the client services right i mean there's studios in la now that you know la studios and margarita mix and those places where you go in and it's about the food it's not even about the studio it's about the food and the services and you watch car washed and and it was just it was like that yeah yeah and that i think is you know that's what's interesting to me about the the difference in the the character of those different scenes where as you say you know la was really it was kind of the birth of the, not the home studio in terms of what we know it now, but really the the home environment, the 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 creature comforts environment. Whereas New York, as you say, it was all business. You know, yeah. which the is, only one in New York that was similar was was okay was Gary Kelgren and Chris Stone when uh-huh. they started the record plan. The record plan, they sure. started to do that style mm-hmm. um, because all the other studios were not like that. I mean, you you had. Uh, 
um, Regent Sound, which was basically office space, um, and they're doing all the rock and roll. And the other Bell Sound was the other big rock and roll studio in New York. There were no independent, independent little Bell Sound. They used to have fights in the old days where the bands would come in and out and in and out in a band. Somebody, okay, you stay for the next group too, because it was Kazanitz and Cats, and it was Tin Pan Alley, and it was just, mm-hmm. it was all this, cra- this crazy, cool recording uh, being done with groups like the Wrecking Crew in L.A., where the band stayed and the yeah. groups switched back and forth. Hal sure. Blaine and I were very good friends uh, uh, when I first met him. Working, for, He was working for uh, doing Fifth Dimension and stuff like that at Wally Studios, um, and Bones Howe was the producer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to help him with his drums, and he had four kits, and they would be delivered all over the place. That was the same thing in New York. Bernard Purdy and Steve Gadd and, you know, it was, it was, it was like that here. And but you as had- you say, that was one of the things that was really interesting about your studio was that you kind of helped to change the complexion of the New York scene because you tried to make it more service-oriented yep. and more, you know, more L.A.-ish, shall we say. Yeah, uh, th- well, it was, we had cappuccino. <laughs> um, that, that's a... That's a that's a. Every, they were sending people out for a cappuccino. I'm, did you? There's a long story about. It. I bought a cappuccino machine on Pico Boulevard, out by, where in the in the antique district there was a there was a kitchen supply place, and I bought a, a cappuccino machine for seven to twenty two thousand dollars. Okay, and had it delivered, you know, from Italy, and it, you push this button, you push this button, it ground this, ground that, and and you know you just. And then it steamed the milk, and it was it was just amazing. And I, and I, uh, everybody gave me Joe Tarzia from Sigma Sound used to give me such a hard time. He says, "How could you spend so much money on that?" And I said, "Okay, here's the deal. At that time, we were charging five hundred dollars an hour for studio time to do movies or television commercials or whatever we were doing. And it took about two minutes to walk from that studio to where the cappuccino machine was. Okay, and then." I had to teach them how to use the cappuccino machine, which took about four minutes, five minutes. Okay, then they did it themselves, and then they would sit there for half a second and talk to one of the movie stars that walked by. So more of nine or ten minutes. Figure out how much an that, hour? Yeah. At $500 an hour. So it, it, it cost $50. So, you know, I'm not sending a, 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 an assistant down to Starbucks for a cappuccino. Right, that's a $50 cup of coffee right there. And then mark it up 35%. I'm doing better buying this $22,000 machine. (laughs) So uh, I told that story at an AES convention or something at one of the award shows and maybe one of the early tech awards shows. And um, Joe reminded me of that. I I got honored at uh, at an AES show uh, a bunch of years ago, and he made me tell that. No, he told the story. Because I used to, whenever we had a SPARS meeting in in New York and and Joe was in New York, I would sneak into his studios and say, and look at Fader 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, because I wanted to see how he was EQing the bass, the Uh kick drum, snare drum, because that Philadelphia sound was just, killer to me yeah yeah and i just was oh i want to sound like the commodores i want to sound like lionel richie i want to sound like earth wind and fire i want to sound like that of course so, a lot uh, of times and, that was the room i mean the room was so important to some of those you uh, know, yeah sound well, some there, of those there places was, there was a lot had to do with the way they were they were recording it also uh-huh. <clears throat> tony bon jovi copied that by putting every single microphone through a pull tech uh-huh mm-hmm. he never used the faders on he never used the the <clears throat> EQ on his knees. Uh, why not? Wow. He, he put everything through Poltec. Mike mm-hmm. Pre and the Poltec. You know, he's a wire nut. He was a gear nut. He was yeah, total. Yeah. And so that was uh, that was the fun day. It's, and it, the best was is that I got to know all of these people, and I was harmless except I was the competition. And but I always. You know, there there was a story the other day. Um, whenever somebody died, that was a jingle guy or a band guy or somebody a voiceover guy, I would get a phone call from one of the lead 
singers in town. He says, Howie, I need your big room. Uh, we have to rehearse for a memorial service. And I said, don't even ask me, just come and do it. I said, I'll, I'll clear it out for you, you come and do it. And I did it, unfortunately, hundreds of times in 40 years. And, that, and I got reminded of that uh, at uh, one of the memorials we did earlier this year for a friend of ours that died of COVID. He was 78 and uh, he smoked too much, but, and he got it and in two weeks he was gone. Uh, uh, a fabulous composer arranger by the name of David Horowitz uh, here in New York. Oh, anyway, sure. Yeah, sure. And, and he, in February he died. Didn't it was like, that. what? Oh, wow. He didn't even know. Huh. what COVID was at that time. So, and people copied what I did too. You know, there was, a, I had four dozen bagels and three pounds of butter and cream cheese and tons of coffee every morning for everybody, it didn't matter. And I always had a refrigerator filled with bottles of water. So we started to buy them smaller and smaller because the talent would come up from Grand Central Station and I would look at them, are you doing a session here today? No, I just came up for a bottle of water. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, and, but you know, I, I mean, I, I have to say that's one of the things that I it think is very unique about your whole operation is that you really did kind of change the complexion of things. And, and you know, granted, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not stroking just you here. A lot of it was, you know, the, the scene itself, the, the whole yeah. art of everything changing. But you really kept pace with that. And you really did, I think help you you were one of the studios and one of the people that really helped to change sort of the the complexion of it from being this almost exclusive little club you know to yeah. i mean yes it's still yeah. exclusive to a certain extent but you know there was a there was a more open and welcoming attitude and you know part of that as you say it's a, it was a west coast thing but mm -hmm. you know and and i mean listen i grew up in new york too i know you're you are like you are a total New Yorker in so many ways. There's no question about it, you know. But yet at the same time, you know, there was a certain attitude about the West Coast music scene that obviously rubbed off on you, you know. And the other thing that I think is interesting about that is that you didn't only take that to the music uh, to the music side of things because you were doing music and jingles, but when you moved into post, you oh. kind of brought that same attitude into the post world. Yep. And the film business as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Doc at Disney. Mm -hmm. and he's a very famous dude. Um, yeah. He's the uh, original Goofy. He's not the Goofy voice, but he talks like that. Yep. And um, yep. uh, I used to go and hang with him because we, we started to do an enormous amount of work for Disney. And just to go there and uh, and have that vibe bro you know no looky no looky sees and and you know going down goofy way and there's Donald Duck over and so and it was just uh, there was always something going on on yep. the Disney lot and so i would be thrilled with that that would be it would be so cool it's like i would go into the foley room not the room the 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 storage room where they have spiders falling off of every place and I mean, no, it was uh, the prop room. Oh, mm -hmm. The prop room at Disney. It's like, oh, my God. I took my children there when they were like eight or ten years old. And I, I could have spent five hours there. It was like. It's like a warehouse. Yeah. Oh, my God. But they, but they had it all jury rigged so that wherever you went, that something happened. You know, something jumped out of you. And, da, 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 da. But it, and they made it so interesting and stuff that other people didn't get to see. Mm -hmm. And. And, you know, just talking to all those people and sitting and having meetings with, with them while we were trying to you know, make deals for, for all the different movies. And I, I must have done 50 movies for them. And, uh, and then uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg left and uh, I got all of them and uh, DreamWorks and everything. And that was fantastic. And then the Warner Brothers and, and uh, the, what's the Apple one? Uh, the... The one that's in uh, Oakland. Uh, who's in Oakland? Film studio. Com uh, uh, Toy Story. But, in Oakland? Uh, I mean, I know, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Marin. You've got uh, Skywalker, you know. Yeah, well, that, that was also cool, too. I, I remember going to Skywalker once and staying there. Why was I there? Tom Kobayashi was still there, I think. And... Uh, 
I followed George Massenberg in. Uh-huh. He was doing Linda Ronstadt. It was a long time ago, but they recorded her in the in the main house. And and you know, one of my favorite stories about being at Skywalker Ranch with Tom Kobayashi and Tom Scott, who actually built it for George Lucas, was that they inject sound into their largest mixing room. They inject the sound because they built it so perfect that when you mix the film. And this was this was just a great story that when you mixed a film and then you took it into a real theater that had air conditioning noise, you couldn't hear half of the little nuances that they were killing themselves to do because the studio that they were mixing, the, the room that they were mixing it in was too perfect. It was and so you could perfect. Hear everything. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And it was it was before it was, you know, maybe three in the front and two in the back. Or, you know, it wasn't all the fancy stuff that. Sure. You know, that, sure. that we have today. And so they, in, they then in figured out what to do and they injected this little s- to sound <laughs> like the air conditioning. Uh, so that was, yeah. that was funny. You know what I love, Howie, is the fact that, I mean, I have always felt just, you know, really privileged to be in this industry, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I've worked for, you know, a lot of long time studio people and, you know, there's a lot of we meet a lot of jaded people in our industry. Let's put it that way. And what I love is the fact that even as many years as you've been doing this, you still have that joy of, you know, oh. the appreciation of knowing what a privilege is it to be in this industry, you know, to, to have these stories to tell and to talk about. You know, I mean, to me, this is there's no industry like this in the world. Yep, yeah, it's it's crazy. I I I want to write the book. And okay, what is it? What am I going to title the book? So one of the things that got me into the recording business was that I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be on stage. One of the things that I never got at home was this. Yep. Yep. You know, so that's why I went out. And I said, okay, well, even if I'm in the orchestra, if they're applauding for 92 of us. That's good enough for me, as long as they're all applauding. <laughs> and I can hide, playing the pursuit, I can hide behind all these other great players. So uh, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make a living that way. Because my teacher was the first bassoonist in the New York Philharmonic. And he was, uh, you know, 1964, he was making uh, 45000 a year, which was a nice sum. But he wasn't an old guy. So by the time it was my turn to be the first bassoonist of Philharmonic, I'd be 60. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, it, so it didn't work. So I said, okay, well, I'm, I want to stay around these cool people, all these great musicians, as wacky as they were and so on and so forth, and being around the actors and the actresses and all that stuff. So I decided to go to the other side of the glass. Yep. So that's what the name of the book was. And somebody's got it already. Guess who it is? Eddie Kramer. Oh, gee, what a surprise. (laughs) (laughs) So I look it up and it says Eddie Kramer. And he has the the name of the book. He didn't write the book yet. I called John up and I said, John, uh, Eddie Kramer's got this thing. He's at the other side of the glass. I want to use it. And he says, call him. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, yeah, it's a book he wants to write about working with Jimi Hendrix. And uh, so you don't want to get in an argument with Eddie, though. No, Eddie's a sweetheart. Eddie's a sweetheart. I saw I saw him do a he class is. the other day uh, on YouTube. It was very interesting. Um, he was at an old Neve, and I, he might have been a uh, he might have been a it was an old Neve. I don't know if it was from Electric Lady, um, but uh, he was telling a story about how to get a certain sound from a certain thing and. Okay. <laughs> that was great. You remember the old Paramount rooms over in over on um, what was that? I think it Which was one? Melrose the one on Melrose? Santa Monica, Boule- Santa Monica Boulevard, I think it was like uh, Santa Monica and La Brea or something like that, over by Nadine's yeah. Music. Right. But yeah, it, and they uh, had that, there was a room up there where he recorded "Cry of Love." Really? Yeah, and I Where's did that? a bunch of sessions in that room. That was the old, the original Paramount Studios. Um, which I Sound guess they department. still call Paramount Recording now. Yeah, yeah. It was it was across the street from the entrance. Exactly, and they Paramount. had uh, they had an old Harrison desk in there. Oh God! And when I first walked in there, they still had all the old mag machines in the back. 
you know, but uh, I, had, I had 20 of those. So I, 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I really do. I love the idea that we are privileged enough to be, you know, not only in this industry, but to have seen these kind of changes, you know, and I mean, you've obviously, you know, you've seen a lot more than I have. I think it's, you know, a little older. Yeah, you're a little older, older you know, but I, but I think it's amazing to me to see what it's evolved to. And yet at the same time, some stuff never changes. You know, no. the personalities no. never change. You know, I mean, w I started talking online yesterday with a kid from the young man from Denmark. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And he's a guitar player and he plays with a bunch of bands and he's and he's, he doesn't know where to go, what to do. He really likes the technology and so on and so forth. And so I didn't realize how young he was. He's, he's just out of. You know, the music conservatory in the Scandinavia's best music conservatory. And I go, OK, well, that just gave it a, a boundary, which mm. is interesting. And I said, uh, OK, I want you to write a letter, write me a letter and tell me what you think you might want to do. Or mm. explain to me the stuff that you've seen and the reason that you want to be in a business. So that I have an idea of how I'm going to drive your bus for you. Right. Because I'm not going to. I, I'll tell you what the, what the directions are, but you really have to do it yourself. And nobody, when I was, went into the business, there were no schools. Nobody. Exactly. Did. Exactly. There were no schools when I went either, you know, and, and you learned everything by looking over the shoulder of right. other people. And what you didn't know, you figured out. I once gave a speech for all the students at AES, and I, I started the speech uh, with a plunger in my hand because <laughs> that's what I had to do. The first thing you have to learn is how to clean the bathroom. Yep. And don't say no because I'm going to hire you because of your attitude, and then I will teach you how to do all the other stuff. Absolutely. Because, because th there is no place that gives you that hands-on experience. And, you know, the, the, a thing I've probably said 10 times before, not today, but with you, um, is would I have lunch with this person that I'm going to hire? Is he going to be fun? Because I just don't want to sit next to somebody that, because yeah. when you're in a room with somebody, you know, the, most of my clients came to my studio for two reasons, me and the engineer they're going to work for. And all the me was all the services and all the surroundings and the newspapers and, you know, and all the shirts I gave everybody and blah, 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 blah. But it's the engineer was really the attraction. So yeah, and, and more than the more than the gear, you know, it, it's really, right. it, as you say, you know, it comes down to you're going to spend so much time with this person. And That's not it. only that, but you're going to spend vulnerable time because you're in a creative process with this They're person, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you got to really, you know, you got to let everything loose. You know, it's like being with a shrink. And most of the time it's not the person who's hired you. It's money. Yes. It's somebody else's money. That's and true. So, and, yeah. and, and but it's their job on the line as opposed to them being the boss or something like that. It was, it was all these, these things that played into it. And I remember trying to take care of, their bosses, uh -huh. you know, the people that came to work with me, I had Nick tickets that I inherited from an uncle. They were American Airlines tickets. My uncle was a sports PR guy, and he had these four seat in, in box 84, eighth row behind the away bench for the Knicks. And... Um, you could see all the movie stars on the other side. Uh, yeah. And they were the hottest ticket in the advertising business. Nobody had better tickets than me. And so I would call up their bosses and I would say, I got two tickets for the Bulls and no boards from you. Got the picture? And I'd hang up. Ooh. <laughs> so, I would, you know, and all of a sudden my phone would ring off the hook. Was, you are a New Yorker. <laughs> It's a, a deal is a deal. That's a New York yeah. hustle all the way. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. And I can't tell you how many times it was just, you know, there, there was a guy always outside of Madison Square Garden. There was a trumpet player who would play. 
And my friend who I went to a million games with, his name is Tom Mooney. He's totally nuts. He's a Vietnam veteran, a rock and roll guy. He was the 1910 Fruit Gum Company on the road. He wasn't even the original 1910 Fruit oh, Gum Company. It. Yummy, yummy, yummy. I yep. love him. That was Joey yep. Levine. One hit wonders. Mm-hmm. One hit wonders, yeah. Oh, he had two. But anyway, uh, <laughs> and whenever we went past the guy with the trumpet, and it would make me laugh every time he'd yell at the trumpet player who's, you know, just got his box open and with coins in it. And he would yell out, play F troop. You <laughs> that, mean the bugle call? <laughs> yeah. It was, a, it was the theme song to F troop was a trumpet solo. Yeah, yeah. And it, <laughs> it was always great. Poor and guy. everybody would fall down laughing when we were walking out of the game, especially if the Knicks won, which wasn't very often when they played the Bulls. But anyway. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So it's too funny. Well, yeah, listen. I will. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your time. This has been a pleasure. Um, My pleasure. I, I would I love, love to work with you on the book. Somebody who understands what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, Howie. If you ever want to work on the book, I will be there to help you. Well, thank you very I much. I would love That's, to. Uh, very nice. Yes. I I don't know how that I could get the emotions that I feel when I'm telling these stories. On paper. That's the hard, that'll be the hard part. Well, you know, let me ask you, why don't you do it as a movie? Why don't you do it as a documentary instead? There's no footage of me doing anything. I could tell stories of other people. Well, we could, fi- we well, could one find... Of the things that I did, one of the things we did today is that I really didn't talk about myself. I talked about situations with other people yes. that I happened to be walking by or... I happened to get invited to, but it wasn't really about, it's never about me. I tried to not do that. Well, you know, I don't and that's say, funny. That, that's funny. That's the same thing. You know, I, w- I had a conversation the other day with a friend of mine. I was, um, you know, when I lived in Germany, I was artist relations for Shure Microphones for the okay. entire time I lived over there. I just fell into this job. And, uh, you know, I, um, I signed them to the Montreux Jazz Festival. I used to go there every summer and, you know. Do you know Joey Ballin? Joey Ballin? The name he sounds very familiar. He was a big deal at Sony Records. Yeah. His, um, uh, it's another long story. I met him because of the Bee Gees from, uh, B, uh, what was the name of the record they were? Uh, the label? They, well, they did Saturday Night Fever. Yeah, so but before they did Saturday Night RSO Fever. RSO Records. RSO, yes. So Robert Stigwood is the reason. My friend Kenny worked for Robert Stigwood. And Kenny used to be worked on a video truck, and he got a job working for Stigwood, who brought uh, the. I think I got Kiss from Stigwood. Anyway, I did all the single albums for Kiss in a little room, no bigger than yours. Huh. No kidding. Uh, my first room, and Gene Simmons and I just we we stayed friends for a lot. And Paul Stanley lived next door to me in my apartment building. And with, it was just this, all, all these small world things would happen to me. But it wasn't about me. And I killed myself. I didn't say I. I always said we. We, yep. Uh, it, was, it was we and it was theirs. And I said, what do you think? And, and that's, you know, that was what my point about being artist relations was. Same thing. Yeah. I worked with all these great artists. I got no photos of me with anybody. You know, because mm-hmm. if you're doing it right, it's not about you. No, it's not about me. You know, and I had a rule that your uh, when phones started to get picture photographs, you know, cameras in them. Mm-hmm. Don't you dare <laughs> take a picture with the with the talent, because because well, well, Paramount you know, Pictures is going to call me and say, wait a minute, because I got I was working with um, I was working with uh, Made in Manhattan. We were doing the movie Made in Manhattan with uh, J Lo. Mm-hmm. And I had a client who was in love with J-Lo. And she was this wacko woman working for an advertising agency. And I didn't have private bathrooms. We just had bathrooms out in the hall. And she chased after J-Lo and accosted her in the bathroom. Oh, no, I, I totally understand growing up a street urchin like you and so on and so forth. Oh, I mean, boy. I'm dying here. Oh, boy. Um, and uh, I had to have... A, Paramount Pictures called me up and get that woman out of the studio, throw her out because we can't have that. If you want to lose Paramount's business, uh, 
Mm. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was what you do. But you know, I, I, I I'll tell you honestly, up, I'll tell you yeah. seriously, we should talk about just making this as sort of a documentary, a little short documentary kind of thing. You know, I'll yeah. I'll, I'll even come out to New York. I'll interview you. We'll dig up photos. We'll do whatever it I takes have, because I, I really everything. think that you telling the story is part of the story. The emotion you're talking about, you're not going to get yeah. that writing it out. No. Because, you know, I was going to tell some other stories. Uh, I have a friend who's uh, in the construction business. He works for HRH. And I had this neighbor whose name is Vinny. Oh, Vinny. Oh, uh, Yes. I got stories about, let me see, was he from New Jersey? Did he, would he work no, in women's no, he garments? Lived in, he, lived, he lived in Scarsdale and he uh. had his initials on his uh, sleeve, you know, and, and he always drove in his Mercedes bent over because he had a heater. He had a gun in his pocket all the uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. And he drove for one of the guys that got rubbed out on, uh, Sp you know, Spark Steakhouse on the, in the East 40s. He mm -hmm. was his driver when that guy got killed. Anyway, so Vinny was my next door neighbor. And one day I showed up at the train station in a suit and tie. And he said, hey, Howie, where are you going? All dressed up. Yeah, I never saw you all dressed up. And I said, I have, a, I have a wedding rehearsal at the Four Seasons. He says, oh, uh, where's the wedding going to be? I said, at the St. Regis. And he says, oh. When you go to the St. Regis, what you're going to do is you're going to pull up your car in front of the St. Regis and you're going to roll down the window and you yell out, Jimmy. And the guy will come and take your car. And don't worry about it. You tell him that you're Vinny's cousin. I said, <laughs> I don't think so. Vinny. He says, no, you got to do it. So my cousin who daughter is getting married at the St. Regis. Multi-zillionaires, they own lots of real estate in New York, blah, blah, blah. She says, we are closing the doors at seven. Don't be late. My daughter will kill me if anybody in my family is late. And I said, okay. So we're driving in from Scarsdale. I have a brand new SL, uh, SEL or S450 or 430. I don't remember what it was, but giant, big giant black fancy and we're wearing a tuck and fancy and we get on 55th street where the st regis is the st regis is on 55th and 5th and it's tour buses and it's all i mean the traffic is disgusting we get stuck on the bronx river parkway in a behind an accident i go oh, we're going to be late and i'm driving with my then wife and i and i said uh i'm going to do it i told her the story I said, i'm going to do it no you're not you're not going to do that i don't want to have anything to do with Vinny. Uh, okay, and we're driving, and it's all the parking garages on 50, 50, full, full, you know, 200, you know, whatever it was. And I said, I'm doing it. I don't care because we're going to be late if I don't do it. So I didn't listen to her. I pulled up in front of the St. Regis, which is going west. So it's on my side. I pulled down the window, and I yell out, hey, Jimmy. And this guy in this cool uniform, like the uh, you know one of those with the hat and the whole thing with the with the braids and the whole bang, and he says, "I said, Jimmy, will you take my car?" He says, "No problem. It'll be right here." And he says, "Oh, I got, I got. It. Don't worry, don't worry. Just, just get out. Come on, let's go." And he opens the door, goes out in the street, and opens the door for my wife to get out. And I said, uh, "I'm." Uh, he says, "Vinny, I know." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. So we go in, and I'm scared shitless because my million dollar car is sitting up there. And we go upstairs, we make it five to seven. We're in, we're in the, in the, uh, where we're getting married and where she's getting married. So the ceremony goes on and on and on. One o'clock in the morning, it's now time to go. And everybody's kind of, well, uh, and we're all, in a bundle all downstairs. Um, there's all these stairs up and there's a Myers Brothers parking kiosk where every single person in my family has got their hand out with their ticket. Take mine, take mine, don't take mine, take mine, take mine, that's, you know. And they're all fighting and sitting at the bottom of the stairs is my car. <laughs> with, the, with the guy standing there with the door open. Hey, <laughs> Jimmy's going away. And my sisters look at me and go, who the f do you know? 
so okay. So now I'm embarrassed. I said, I just go, uh, and I go down again. And he says, and I, I can't have no clue what to give him. What do you tip a guy? A hundred? No, I, that's too much. No, okay. So I, I, t- I get 75 bucks out. And I, I roll it up and I put it in his palm. He doesn't look at it. Doesn't bother to look at it. And I go, okay. So I did good. <laughs> Saved myself 30 bucks. So <laughs> he then says, take your coat off. Get comfortable. Really? Yeah, don't worry. Just don't worry about it. And then uh, I, so I take my jacket off, you know, I button my tie and so on and so forth. And he helps my wife into her side of the car. And then he says, get in, go on, get in. And I get in and start it up. And then he goes out in the street and he holds up traffic so that we can get out of the spot. He just stops traffic on 55th Street. And we left and we looked at each other when we got in the car. I said, holy shit, that was cool. So yeah, I did it 20 times. I did it at the Ritz Carlton when we had the thing called, um, what was it called? There was, um, uh, what was his name? The, the artist that did, that, uh, I forget what his name is. And he did all these flapping orange things all over Central Park. I did it at the Plaza Hotel. Oh, Christo. No? Huh? Christo. Christo. Yeah. yeah, Christo. So I, I, I call, called out. Oh, I, this is, this is a, another part of the story. I called out, hey, Jimmy. And the guy comes out to my car and says, I'm not Jimmy. I'll take, take your car for you. And I said, okay, what's the, what's the deal? He says, well, here's the deal. Um, I can put it in a garage. It's like 75, 80 bucks. Or and he leans in, you can gratuitize me. <laughs> I never heard that word before. <laughs> and so I looked at him and I went, <laughs> That's it. And so I left my car with him and I t- you know, and we went across the street and we looked at the Cristo and then we went into the bar and we had dinner and my car was still sitting out in front of the Ritz Carlton on Central Park South. It's amazing. It was like, okay. So I gave him 70 bucks. Everything was fine. I did it at the plaza. Oh, so I was taking my kids to a, a grand ball at the at MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, for all the advertising people. It's called AICP. Big, big, big parties. Thousand people taking over MoMA. And it's, it's amazing. Um, so I pull up in front of the St. Regis and I say, Jimmy. And he says, yes, sir. He says, oh. Well, I they all named know. Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. It's a password. Of course. Yeah. It's a password. Yeah. So he says to me, so he says to me, he says, uh, uh, it'll be right here. Oh, wait a minute, where are you going? I said, we're going to MoMA. He says, oh, you don't have to walk, come on. And he, I said, what? So it's my daughter, my girlfriend, and me. And we get into the Maybach. They have this gigundo Maybach sitting there. And he says, okay, let me take it. And I said, okay. <clears throat> so we're driving down 55th Street to the to Museum of Modern Art. And everybody in after and SAG is on strike. Oops. I'm signatory. Voiceover. All the voiceover guys are on strike, and they're all standing out in front of MoMA picketing all the advertising industries, which is AICP. And I get out of fucking Maybach. <laughs> out of a Maybach. And, I go, and they're all going, Harry, Harry, because they all know me. They don't know the advertising industry guys, because one of the funny things was, because I was signatory, they would always say, Who's the last person you work for? The SAG and after guys when they go claim unemployment? So they go, Howie. Do you know I used to get 20 a day? People call claiming unemployment? Because we used to have 50, 75 talent through there every day. 13 studios. It, we, we're cranking it. So, so that's part of that's another part of my history that so, oh, I get all worked it's, up. And it's tell it's politics, stories. you know the the politics and the and the all of the unspoken stuff, you know. I mean, oh, that's what yeah. to me makes this industry so fascinating, you know. Yeah. So um, somebody told me a story the other day about um, with the mayor, and they had to go someplace. Oh, they had to go to Yankee Stadium, and there was traffic jams every place. And they had the you know the cones out. The cops are all over the place in the Bronx trying to get the Yankee Stadium. 
it was a new Yankee Stadium. And so he leans over and he says, uh, it's a, you know, some famous rich Jewish real estate guy that he's working for. And he said, the password is Sergeant Kelly. Okay. So if you're stuck in traffic and the cops are there, you roll down your window and said, hey, Sergeant Kelly. And he says, okay. And he put, takes the cones out of the way and you go on the other side of the street. <laughs> I never did that one, but, but that was that's that's funny stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because I used to I used to always laugh about the fact that I could walk into venues and I, nobody ever asked me what I was doing there, and nobody ever, you know, I guess I just looked like I knew what I was doing, you know. But right. I'd uh -huh. walk in backstage, you know, without a badge or anything, you know. So I think a lot of it really, as you say, you know, it's kind of in the delivery, you know. It's like and it's your your own attitude, you know. Are you so cool? True. It's so I remember true. trying to get into Studio 54 like that, and um, I'm from Buffalo, and my father owned .0001 of the Buffalo basketball team, whatever they were called, <laughs> and uh, Bob McAdoo was their star player, and I see Bob McAdoo, who had been to my house for dinner, I said, Bob, he says, oh, come on, you want to go in, Howie? Let's go, and I said, okay, <laughs> and that's how I got into my one and only time in Studio 54. Once, so, I, from what I hear, once was enough. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, uh, yeah, it was enough. I love it. Well, seriously, first of all, thank you for this. It's been a pleasure, pleasure. absolutely. Um, but more importantly, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you ever want to do this, I, you know, I've worked on documentaries. I've worked on, you know, helping people tell their stories, and. Boy, I tell you, if there's anybody whose story I'd love to help, help tell, it's yours. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.